Good evening, and welcome to the AOTF Research Excellence Symposium. A few years ago, the foundation introduced two new awards to recognize not only research excellence, but to highlight early and mid-career investigators who are showing promise and contributing to advancing knowledge in the field of occupational therapy. Tonight, you will hear from the 2021 AOTF Early Career Research Excellence Awardee, Zhou Ying, Cynthia Lee from the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston and the 2021 AOTF Mid-Career Research Excellent Awardee, Jessica Kramer from the University of Florida. You will also hear from this year's AOTF Academy of Research inductees, Kathleen Doyle-Lyons from Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center and Sean Roll from the University of Southern California. Established in 1983, the AOTF Academy of Research recognizes individuals who have made exemplary, distinguished, and sustained contribution toward the science of occupational therapy. We are excited to bring you this relatively new AOTF symposium and to honor these individuals who are exemplars of research excellence in the field of occupational therapy. Our first speaker is Cynthia Lee. Dr. Lee completed her PhD in Health and Rehabilitation Sciences in 2015 from the Medical University of South Carolina and currently serves as an associate professor in the Department of Occupational Therapy and as core faculty in the Division of Rehabilitation Scientists at the University of Texas Medical Branch. Much of Dr. Lee's work uses large administrative health data and sophisticated objective measurement approaches to develop, validate, crosswalk, and optimize functional assessments for persons living with disabilities. In 2020, Dr. Lee was awarded a KO1 grant from the NICHD, National Center for Medical Rehabilitation Research, to evaluate the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid services standardized functional data. She is also funded with a health service research grant from the AOTF to examine the impact of patient-driven grouping model in home health as it relates to patient characteristics and rehabilitation outcomes. Dr. Lee's research focuses on policy-related questions that directly affect occupational therapy practice and research. Dr. Lee's research goal is to use her work to provide scientific evidence that informs clinicians, researchers, and policymakers to facilitate the success of value-based rehabilitation. The title of Dr. Lee's talk is My Research and Career Journey Thus Far. Dr. Lee, welcome. Thank you, MJ, for your wonderful uh, introduction. Right now, uh, let me share my screen. Give me a second. All right, so thank you everyone for attending my presentation. It's an honor to share with you my research and career journey as an LTF Early Career Research Excellence Award recipient this year. Before I start, I would like to share with you a story of mine. One day, my friend invited me to a kayaking trip in Florida. Based on my one and only kayaking experience during a church retreat in New Hampshire, I thought I would spend about 20 to 30 minutes to enjoy peaceful view and tranquility. So I agreed fairly happily and quickly to join her uh, kayaking trip. Little did I know, it's actually a three mile kayaking trip. As you can see from the picture, maybe you cannot see clearly, so I highlight the star from you. It is uh, a very long, uh, once you start, you cannot stop. So typically it took about 30 minutes to kayak a, a mile. But I think that day we probably spent um, more than three hours on that trip. And it was totally different than what I expected. I didn't bring food and my friend shared with me some sandwich and actually they prepare for me and I was very thankful for that. I do have a water. Thankfully, I also have a pedals, uh, very functional pedals, and I also have sunglasses. 
So even though uh, the tree was longer than I thought, and it took more preparations than I thought, but uh, surprisingly, I also see something amazing view, including this uh, manatee. Uh, usually you would not be able to uh, see that. So in the end, I complete the trick and also I enjoy the view uh, with a lot uh, of gratitude of friendship and also the nature. Here I would like to share with you a little bit about my research and career journey. My first research experience started when I was an OT student at National Taiwan University. I was a research assistant and I helped professors collect prospective data at the inpatient rehab unit at the hospital. My master thesis was to develop a computerized scoring system for a drawing test called house tree person drawing. At that time, I was kind of skeptical about my own study. I was wondering whether I can really find any differences when I collect data from individuals with uh, psychiatry diagnosis versus individual from uh, college, basically they are, co they are college students. But if you can see that, uh, I put some examples here. On the left side, you can see the drawings from uh, the individual with psychiatric diagnosis. On the right side, you can see the drawings from the college students. Only by observation, you can see the demonstration of the painting are very different. This actually is the motivation for me to do research. I realized we can really capture qualitative data using a certain methodology and approaches we can really find information that are meaningful and not just the numbers or uh, a simple, uh, simple uh, formulas. After that, I worked for two years in clinic as occupational therapist, and I came to the States to study my PhD. I received my PhD in 2015 from Medical University of South Carolina. I stay at MUC for another year to, uh, to learn more about health services research. Here, I would like to give you some examples of what I learned during that, my PhD study and my postdoc training at MUSC. By learning RUSH model, I learned we can actually transform an ordinal scale to interval scales. I also learned about we can put patient ability or person ability level with test item difficulty level on the same scale. I also had opportunities to participate in the uh, PROMIS patient reporting outcome measurement information system, uh, self care, uh, excuse me, self efficacy uh, system. I use the veterans data to look at uh, different, uh, different functional assessment between functional independence major and uh, minimum data sets. I also developed four item and eight item short forms. On the left side, you can see the key form generated from the RUSH model. On the left hand is a individual with lower attention function on the right side is an individual with higher attention function. You can see their functional scores distribution are fairly different, and this can be used as an intervention guidance. I also learned about secondary data analysis, including using national data, such as Enhance Edge Cup. In addition to that, I also got the chance to know more about longitudinal study design. In this figure, you can see this is a data across 20 years. I put the functional uh, test, the same, uh, the same patient they could do from 1995 to 2005. So from, uh, from the figure, you can see that 
uh, individual with spinal cord injuries, their function, the tests they can do actually decrease overall. But they, the decrease rate actually vary by in, uh, injury levels. After that, I came to uh, UTMB to learn more skills about large data research. I did a second year postdoc at the Center for Large Data Research in Rehabilitation. I start a faculty position in 2018. As a postdoctoral fellow at UTMB, I received my first internal grant from Older Americans Independent Center at UTMB. This pilot grant, I look at the association between functional status and care transition and also hospital readmissions. I also got selected as a, a scholar for the grain writing workshop. It's called uh, Tiger. It's a training in grantsmanship for rehabilitation research um, at MUSC. This grant workshop is really helpful for me to learn lots of grant writing uh, skills is a week you can schedule an uh, appointment with very well-known researchers and uh, grant uh, program officers. You talk with them your ideas one-on-one, -on -one, and I learned so much about uh, grant writing from this workshop. I submit my Q1 in 2019, June, and I received an impact score of 12 in October from NIH and ICHD. My grant started in April 2020. At the same time, I also received a health, health services research grant from AOTF. This journey has been a continuous process for me and I have learned so much. Overall, this is a summary to share with you my research interests. I have expertise in outcome measurement, which particularly using item response theory and brush model. By learning about objective measurement, I can understand whether the, the measurement uh, truly improve, uh, patient function can be really objectively measured through their intervention process. I also have skills and knowledge in health services research. Overall, my, my research is to look at patterns of care, including care utilization and patient outcomes. Patient outcomes not only including functional status, I also have, uh, have studied several projects uh, using uh, the outcome as uh, quality outcomes, including hospital readmissions. I also have expertise in longitudinal aging study. I have been participant in a study over 40 years, uh, 40 years length of the project. I also currently participating in the R1 project, which is to look at older Mexican Americans, their aging health. This study has been uh, collect data collection uh, in, still in process so far, we have 19 years data. For my K01, I'm going to focus on looking at section GG, which is a standardized patient functional assessment mandated by CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. I will, uh, for the K01, I will particularly compare the functional independence measure with section GG. Since uh, functional independence measure have been used for the past de decade, uh, we really want to know whether this transition to session GG can really affect how we evaluate, how we treat, and how we reimburse patients. I will also learn data science uh, methodologies through my K1 training. Data science te technologies has been uh, more and more 
popular these days due to large uh, data has been emerging in many, many different uh, professional areas. I will learn machine learning and artificial intelligence and also learn more about electric health records to do, uh, to do research that can really help us truly understand health system and the impact on the patient outcomes. So overall, the underlying uh, motivation for my research is that I really want to have um, make a bridge between clinicians and policymakers. What do I mean by that? So usually when we think about as a clinician, we think about functional status, that's pretty much our focus. We want to improve patient's function. We want to design uh, treatment planning. We want to make sure patient's functional status can be improved after our intervention. However, for the policymakers, they usually focus more on cost uh, aspect, such as hospital read readmission. Uh, the main reason is that the hospital readmission is fairly costly in healthcare system. Sometimes these two focuses could not be communicated with each other. So my work is to find a bridge to make uh, these two areas to talk with each other. I really think both areas are important and we should pay attention uh, to both. Here is an example to show you uh, one of my work. This, uh, this is published in the GEMDA journal. So if you would like to know more details, please feel free to uh, take a look. You can see I look at hospital readmission reduction program, which is the policy maker's focus. In addition, I look at post-acute care, which is clinician's focus. I would like to know how this can really affect our clinician when we provide services to patients. To give you a very brief uh, overview about uh, the, this policy, health hospital readmission reduction program, HRP, you can see the timeline we use in this study from 2007 to 2015. Health policy is a very uh, long longitudinal process. Sometimes it will take uh, more than uh, five years, uh, 10 years, just to make, uh, to make it the process that in the end can really be implemented. You can see I put uh, this period of time as pre-pass, pre-implementation and post-implementation, uh, three different phase of time period of the HRP. For the first period A, we define pre-passage when uh, before the March 2010. Where during that time, uh, HRP uh, was passed as a result of the Affordable Care Act. After that, we have period B, which is from April 2010 to December 2011. We have the third post-implementation phase, which starts from January 2013 to August 2015. So far, lots of literature they have found the effectiveness of HRP to reduce hospital readmissions. However, there's no study truly look at the follow-up effect. Most of the study they have done at the hospital because the HRP focus on reducing hospital readmissions, the hospitals, they got penalties if they did not um, meet certain criteria of the uh, hospital readmission rates. But we don't look at after patient discharge from the hospital. What about patient they discharge and whether they go back to the hospital or not? So for, for this study, we actually include more than uh, the target conditions. We try to include the conditions that can uh, really um, very commonly we treat uh, in rehab overall. 
For the HRP target conditions, studies have found that HRP can really reduce hospital readmission for acute uh, MI, heart failure, and pneumonia. But there's no study really look at non-target conditions, however important to rehab services. These three conditions uh, we choose are ischemic stroke, total heat uh, THA and TKA, and uh, heat femur fractures. So what we found is there is an increase in quarterly post-acute post use um, when, when the hospital readmission decrease actually the post-acute care use increase. But it's not for every condition. We found this holds true for three conditions in our study, including the AQMI, heart failure, and the hip femur fracture. We do found a different finding when uh, post-acute care use increase it actually was significantly associated with an increase in readmission, readmission rates for total hit astroplastic and total knee astroplastic. This finding actually uh, gave us some insight in terms of uh, health uh, services we provide to the patients that can really be affected by the policy we found that the post-acute care use and readmission rates actually vary significantly during implementation period, no matter they are target or non-target conditions. There is an effect uh, known as split over effect, meaning that even though the policy only uh, focused on certain conditions, the hospital or the uh, health care providers, they will change how they treat other conditions just because they watch and observe um, the, the policy impact on that condition already being targeted. So the split over effect was uh, supported and found in our study. We also found that the impact on readmissions after post-acute care uh, for certain impairment group, can, uh, they are mediated by the type of post-acute care services received. Here is just a brief summary of the grant I received. The NIHQ1 award is to examine standardized functional assessment data. Section GG is actually part of the SPADE, uh, SPADE questionnaire. Under the SPADE, SPADE stands for standardized patient uh, assessment data elements. Under the SPADE, there are different sections from A, B, C, uh, until HI. Session GG is one of the uh, functional goals and state status in, in that SPADE questionnaire. I really want to know more about Session GG because we, as an OT, we use Session GG a lot. And we try to understand and evaluate patient's function using this assessment. However, right now, um, right now is fairly new. As you can see in this slide, previously there have been different functional assessments used at different post-acute care settings, including the ERF-PI, which is um, basically the functional in independence major, minima data set, and uh, outcome and assessment information set. So this different functional assessments has been, um, has been used for decades. And the policy agency, they have been uh, advocates the CMS to uh, mandate standardized functional assessment. Because when there's a, a issue, uh, when there's a problem, there's a policy. So the problem is the different agency that use different 
assessment system, and they could not be compared with each other. So after the impact at the Improving Medicare uh, Post-Secure Care Transformation Act of 2014, they starting to use uh, SPAE across uh, all post-secure care settings. I will encourage you to read and be more familiar with impact ads, as I believe every OT should understand uh, the policy affecting our practice. For the AOTF Health Services Research Grant, I will look at the OT services intensity in home health and how that affects health outcomes. I provide a brief uh, figure here so you can understand um, the one we look at in this project. The yellow highlighted are the one uh, we really focus in this proposal. We really want to know who are the participants uh, OT provides service to and whether their characteristics can really affect their outcomes in home health settings. We uh, intentionally choose two uh, impairment uh, groups based on the current, the most updated policy, because we would like to know whether these two impairment group neuro, neurological conditions uh, and musculoskeletal conditions, are they really be uh, affected in this policy? And how can we really provide uh, suggestions and implementations uh, for, for, this, uh, for this group of patients? My goal is to generate a manuscript that can be really uh, highlight the value of occupational therapy and help our profession to, um, to advocate our professional's value and role um, and in terms of how to provide value best rehab. Here, I change a little uh, a gear to share with you um, kind of the view I have when I uh, was a stu still a student, um, one of my uh, committee members actually drew a line, very, uh, very distinct line. I still keep that paper in my drawer. She put the, all the time that each day for me. So after you got a PhD, you got a K01, you got a KR21, then you got R01. So I think this is fairly simple. It's very easy process. But what it really, uh, what it really takes actually is on the right side, the figure you can see. It actually takes quite a few uh, learning experiences and you turn many turns and on the end, you probably get the first grant. So I would like to summary uh, what I learned so far and I hope that can be uh, a little insight or maybe you can get some useful advice from this uh, presentation. I have some suggestions that when you try to navigate your career, it's great if you, if you can find a mentor who can really uh, support and guide you. And it will be really, really uh, meaningful and helpful if you can collaborate with others, because we all know that research cannot be done by one person. You want to find a supportive group that can really help you to grow your skills and learn the skills that you need to make sure you can be successful. You also want to demonstrate your values and learn about the values that can that was uh, that is emphasized in your working environment. So not only care about yourself, you, you care about your environment, you care about the people you are working with and you create a su supportive team that can um, move forward together. I also cannot em emphasize enough of the importance of perseverance. And you can repeat that for three times. Perseverance means you will never give up even after you fail. And that's pretty much we will encounter at, in the academic in environment. Your grant got rejected, your manuscript got rejected, uh, your application got rejected. But that doesn't mean that it ends there. If you don't give up and if you keep trying, and you will always, always, you can learn from that experiences. And don't forget to really 
also do your self care and enjoy what you are doing. I think that's kind of the part, very important uh, core concept uh, in everything you are doing. I also just want to uh, provide this as a, um, just give everybody a laugh. This is kind of like a continuous process and hopefully everybody can really find their stage and uh, through this process, um, support each other to grow. I want to acknowledge the great mentorship I have received and I'm sure I probably missed some of them. Um, all the mentors really helped me uh, without them, I cannot uh, be who I am today. And here is me and, and you can see, I pretty much enjoy my kayaking much better. Uh, on the right side, you can see it's from the Kawa model. <laughs> um, so if life is a river, I hope everyone can uh, have a second and think about what's your river flowing today and what made your uh, journey more smooth and how can you improve and how can you change to, um, to really uh, enjoy your journey in the end. And here are citations of these pictures. Thank you. Dr. Jessica Kramer is an associate professor in the Department of Occupational Therapy at the University of Florida. Dr. Kramer received her PhD in disability studies from the University of Illinois at Chicago in 2008, where she worked in the model of human occupation clearinghouse and was mentored by Dr. Gary Kilhoffner, as well as Dr. Joy Hamill. She completed postdoctoral training at the Health and Disability Research Institute at Boston University with Dr. Wendy Costner and Dr. Alan Jetty. She was a member of the Boston University Department of Occupational Therapy faculty from 2009 to 2019. In 2019, Dr. Kramer returned to her OT on the mater at the University of Florida, where she is now building her body of research. Dr. Kramer has received over $1.5 million in extramural funding from NIH, Nidler, and PCORI, among others. A hallmark of Dr. Kramer's research is her strong collaboration across a variety of organizations, institutions, and investigators. Dr. Kramer's title of her talk tonight is Participation of Youth and Young Adults with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, What's Theory Got to Do With It? Dr. Kramer, welcome. It's great to have you. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here today. And I'm excited to present to you my talk, Participation of Youth and Young Adults with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, What's Theory Got to Do With It? I'd like to set the stage by orienting you to my lab, the Youth and Young Adult Empowerment, Leadership, and Learning Lab, or Yale Lab. In the Yale Lab, I partner with youth with IDD to develop and evaluate rehabilitation products. We design quality patient-reported outcome measures, or PROMs, and we also develop and evaluate community-based interventions. I'm going to begin my talk by taking a little bit of a deep dive into some of the theoretical and philosophical foundations of my work to then illustrate to you how those theories can inform a body of research. First, the theoretical concept of participation is the foundation and targeted outcome of my research. Since the development of the ICF classification in 2001, there's been growing attention to participation as a valued outcome of interest in rehabilitation. But of course, we know that participation via engagement in occupations has been the focus of occupational therapy from the founding of our profession. Recently, leaders in our field have pushed our thinking about the construct of participation for children and youth and highlighted the dynamic and multidimensional nature of the concept of participation. 
Koster and colleagues and IMS and collaborators have both proposed models in which participation entails the act of being present, as well as the experience of one's quality of participation. Both highlight this reciprocal influence of environments on participation. So this conceptualization of participation as multidimensional and dynamic is crucial when considering the participation and occupations of young adults with IDD, which occur across multiple environments and contexts. In our society, transition to adulthood is a time when we expect young people to form a more independent identity and new occupational identities, including becoming a worker, moving out, forming independent relationships of their own. For young people with IDD, navigating new support systems places additional challenges on their successful transition to adulthood and on continued engagement in invalued occupations. Therefore, my research focuses on meeting the needs experienced by young people during this crucial transition period. The social model of disability is the recognition that disability is not a product of individual differences, but rather is socially created through political, economic, and cultural structures. The social model of impairment, specifically applied to individuals identified with intellectual disabilities, calls attention to the political and social nature of diagnostic criteria therefore pro providing us with a framework for critically evaluating our assumptions about ability. The social model has been critiqued, uh, some for ignoring lived experiences of the body, for continuing to define disabling barriers, using people with disabilities as a reference group, and for not fully integrating diverse voices and experiences. However, the social model of disability and impairment remains a crucial tool for rehabilitation in its very clear and simple assertion that the medical definition of disability is nothing more than a socially constructed category used to justify the hegemony that there is a non-disabled norm for which we all must aspire. My line of research as influenced by an inclusive research philosophy could be best described as collaborative, in which the goals or purpose are equally valued by all members of the team, including those with and without disabilities, and where each team member is valued for the unique expertise that they bring. Wamsley and colleagues define inclusive research by its contribution to social change, its basis on issues that are important to that group, and that it draws on the group's experience to inform research process and outcomes. Inclusive research is also value added. That is, it leads to unique benefits, products, or findings that are not possible in traditional approaches to knowledge production, or that would not be possible if each group worked alone. Collaborating with youth and young adults with disabilities from the ground up in the creation of ideas and the design of methods and in the interpretation of our findings has resulted in innovative approaches that I'm excited to share in my presentation today. Mixed methods is often presented as a third paradigm, one guided by pragmatism. This third paradigm avoids the artificial distinction that a positivist epistemology is always associated with quantitative methods and that constructivist epistemologies adopt qualitative methods. Anwar Jabuzi, a leading scholar in mixed methodology, has asserted that this paradigm, the mixed methods paradigm, is a radical middle, one in which there is fluid, productive coexistence that recognizes the overlap between these two approaches. In my own research, the radical middle that I attempt to reach is one in which we obtain a deep understanding of the needs and lived experiences of young adults with disabilities and their families, but where we can also quantify the impact of those interventions on their everyday lives. It's my aim, even if I've not fully achieved it, to use the knowledge gained through this radical middle approach to understand more fully the mechanisms underlying participation challenges and opportunities for intervention outcomes. 
So now that you've seen those theoretical and philosophical foundations, I want to give you a theory-driven research exemplar, and that's with something called Project Team. Project Team prepares youth with IDD to systematically identify environmental barriers and supports, to generate modification strategies, and to request changes in their environment. This is guided by the game plan as shown here, a systematic step-by-step -step approach that guides youth through a goal, plan, do, check, problem-solving process. So project team operationalizes the social model understanding that the source of participation restrictions are in the environment. It also reflects the ICF conceptualization that the environment can be matched to the needs of the individual to enhance participation. Project team is uniquely focused on enabling young adults to identify environmental barriers and supports across 11 components of the environment identified from a metasynthesis of youth perspectives on participation and that also draw from ICF environment chapters. Examples include people, outside places, rules, and light, sound, and smell. Project team is a multi-component intervention that includes a group curriculum, peer mentoring, and a community-based outing that are all focused on a personal participation goal salient to young adults. Young adults set goals to increase their participation in a range of contexts, including leisure participation, employment or pre-vocational exploration, and school or post-secondary education. Also influenced by the social model of disability is the use of peer and social learning approaches. Project team is co-facilitated by a licensed professional, such as an occupational therapist, and an experienced advocate who identifies as a person with a disability. During those group sessions, youth encourage and assist each other during activities. And finally, peer mentors with disabilities model the use of the game plan in one-to-one -one weekly sessions. These social learning approaches privilege the expertise people with disabilities have navigating their environments and are in a direct contrast to the assumption that professional expertise is always the most helpful for people with disabilities. We hypothesize that through this multiple opportunities to practice this problem solving process, that youth would attain these participation goals. Project team underwent an inclusive development process. Starting in 2010, a total of eight youth with a variety of disabilities contributed over 300 combined hours to develop project team from the ground up. The group originally helped to develop the components of the curriculum as well as the game plan problem solving process. So one of their crucial contributions was the, was the addition of a problem solving step shown here. Would using this strategy change the activity for other people? The young adults pulled on their own experiences with advocacy successes and failures. And they felt strongly that considering the impact of their requested accommodations on others was an essential element to garnering social capital and success. Without their experiences, this component would be missing from the game plan problem solving process. As our research progressed, the team played a key role in evaluating project team, which I'll show you in a few slides. So after several years of development and piloting, we received funding that allowed us to compare 47 youth with IDD who completed project team to 35 youth who completed goal setting in a similar time period. And we chose this active comparison because we know that goal setting is not of itself motivating. So immediately following the completion of the intervention or goal setting period, we found that youth completing project team had significantly greater goal attainment scaling T-scores or GAS T-scores, which included both that specific participation goal and the application of problem solving skills when applied to their goal. When we look at a six week follow-up period without support, without any intervention, we also found that project team youth had significantly higher attainment of their participation goal. At this time, only 2.4% of project team youth did not attain their participation goal compared with 22% of youth in the goal setting only group. 
It's also exciting to report that our study demonstrated that peer mentoring by young adults with IDD is feasible. We found that peer mentors could implement project team with fidelity, and we saw 87% adherence to those fidelity objectives for all, across all calls and dyads. We also found that peer mentors were able to engage mentees in conversation without the direct intervention of adults or professionals. And this was made in part through the use of universally designed supports, for example, a peer mentoring script. When peer mentor Wanda described the responsibilities of her role as a peer mentor, she explained, it's my chance to walk my mentees through this process with giving very good examples of how to do this. We also evaluated what we call the social validity of project team from the perspectives of youth in the program as well as their parents. We asked each questions about the acceptability and relevance of the purpose, procedures, and perceived benefits of project team. We found that youth with DD, IDD, and their parents find the purpose and focus of project team relevant to their everyday lives and their future lives as adults. The reported acceptability of the procedures really highlights the benefits of those social learning approaches and of the fun of the intervention activities that were co-developed by the other young adult collaborators. Youth and parents alike report benefits that they value, such as empowerment, skills, increased skills, and participation. We did find that youth and parents found it difficult to think in this new way about the environment or disability rights, suggesting that in the future, more supports needed to help make that shift. So what's next for project team? We're currently undergoing some preliminary usability testing of a game plan app instead of a paper and pencil version with a long-term goal to potentially use AI that could then predict the most effective strategy for resolving reported environmental barriers using the app. I'm also partnering with CP Achieve, directed by Dr. Christine Imms, in, uh, to adapt project team for the Australian service delivery and policy context. In my remaining time, I'd like to give you one more theory-driven research example, and that's for something called the PD-PRO, the Pediatric Evaluation of Disability Inventory Patient Reported Outcome. It's a mouthful. So the ACA is driving changes in healthcare by mandating services that are aligned with patient-centered goals and that consider patient-reported quality. So the PD-PRO is a response to this opportunity. This measure allows youth and young adults to self-report their perceived performance of discrete tasks that are required to engage in familiar everyday life situations important for successful transitions to adulthood. So here you see our inclusive CATS research team who has contributed across Boston and the University of Florida almost 400 hours thus far to develop the PD Pro items, images, and select the final things that we're testing based on pilot results. So the PD Pro conceptual measurement framework is really unique and reflects two influences. First, this in-depth understanding of activity performance that we gained through this inclusive design process. And it also reflects the ICF, which I'm sure you can see in that depiction. So when we initially began developing the PD Pro, we wanted to develop items in three domains aligned with the original parent reported PD CAT. So daily activities, social cognitive, and mobility. But we quickly found in our inclusive research process that items organized around these professionally defined domains really lack meaning and relevance. So when we ask youth and young adults to talk about items in their daily activities or talk about mobility items, they are perceived as decontextualized from everyday activities. This decreases comprehension and the quality of the self-reflection required for a meaningful self-report. But conversely, when we talk about uh, performance in the context of familiar everyday life situations, young adults can really reflect on their performance. Therefore, the PD Pro doesn't administer items by domain, but rather organizes items representing each domain in a variety of everyday life situations, as seen here, going to a restaurant. 
The development of the PD Pro is also informed by the social model of disability and impairment in our attempts to maximize cognitive accessibility. There's an assumption that youth and young adults with IDD are less reliable or less accurate reporters, and this is typically attributed to cognitive differences. However, using the social model of impairment, we can problematize that assumption and instead see the design of the prom itself as the cause of unreliable or inaccurate reports. We proposed a framework that assessment developers can use to design cognitively accessible measures, guidelines around content, layout, and administration procedures. We hypothesize that this type of cognitively accessible prom design can bolster the validity and reliability of self-reports by youth with IDD. So this illustrates how the PD Pro operationalizes that cognitive accessibility framework. For example, it uses 3D images to help ensure people comprehend items. It includes interactive response buttons that are easy to see and automatically reads out loud all text. It also includes some other administration features such as a learn to use the PD Pro teaching module in which respondents can practice using those categories. So our results show that youth can have good content, but there can be good content validity when we use this accessible, um, cognitively accessible framework. Of the 116 items evaluated by 37 young adults with IDD, over 85% of their responses on average match the intended item meanings. We also use qualitative research to understand the processes that youth were using to self-evaluate their performance of these functional tasks. And we learned that young people's self-reported abilities to complete these tasks incorporate the use and availability of environmental supports and strategies. So sometimes young people were the people mobilizing this support. So for example, they might request assistance from an adult that they trust, or they might use technology like a phone to support task completion. So their positive self-evaluation encompasses their active and successful use of those strategies. In other instances, young people described how environmental supports provided by others, for example, an accessible space or an adult that was maybe scaffolding activity completion influenced their performance. So in light of these findings, the PD Pro allows youth to consider their performance while using these supports. The cognitive accessible design also supports good consistency we administered the PD Pro to 55 youth with IDD and cognitive impairments, and they completed it twice, two times, one to two weeks apart. And we saw ICC absolute agreement values in the moderate to good range, and these results match or exceed other test retest reliability results obtained in other measurement studies with respondents with IDD. So what's next for the PD Pro? I'm excited to be in the process of conducting an NIH funded study to validate the PD Pro. So in conclusion, my presentation today demonstrates how theory can drive a program of research. It has everything to do with developing tools that enhance the participation of young adults with IDD. I'd like to recognize and thank my research mentors who provided the encouragement, opportunities, and challenges that supported my career growth. I want to thank all of my research partners who pushed my thinking and the quality of our work, and I especially want to call out those whose work and contributions were featured in today's presentation. I want to thank the University of Florida Department of Occupational Therapy for supporting my nomination. Thank you to AOTF for providing support to me over all these years, starting as a PhD student. And finally, recognize that the work featured in today's uh, presentation was funded by the following agencies and foundations. And references are available upon request. Thank you. Kathleen Doyle Lyons is a senior scientist at Darth Mc Hitchcock Medical Center. Her research is focused on building the evidence base for occupational therapists working in oncology. She is trained in experimental design, mixed methods, and implementation science. Her research program is designed to answer the following question. 
how can we support people living with cancer to fully participate in meaningful activities, life roles, and society through theory-driven and evidence-based rehabilitation. Dr. Lyons designs and tests pragmatic interventions that blend occupational therapy and behavioral therapies. Her research is primarily community-based as she has developed both telehealth and home-based interventions. Dr. Lyons' title of her talk this evening is Optimizing Activity Engagement After Cancer Treatment. Dr. Lyons, welcome and thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the chance to share my research in this forum. I'll start by saying I'd like to thank the Academy. Joining the Academy of Research is a big honor, and I'm very grateful to Kitty Reed for noticing my work, and to Helen Cohen, Linda Tickledaken, and to Beth Skidmore for nominating me. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank the American Occupational Therapy Foundation. In 2018, I had the privilege of chairing the planning grant collective they sponsored, where the goal was to catalyze research in cancer rehabilitation. And this is the paper that came out of the collective where we made the case that occupational therapy researchers could lead the way in addressing participation restrictions of cancer survivors. I've been singing that song for years, and it was, it's the focus of the research that I'm gonna talk about today. So I thought I would start with an origin story with this talk today that shows how I developed this rather adamant opinion about how occupational therapy practitioners can contribute to cancer care. So before I got my doctorate, I practiced OT for six years, but I didn't specialize in oncology. When I finished my doctorate, I took a job at Dartmouth College, managing an RCT where we were testing a palliative care intervention. And in 2003, there weren't any OTs working on the clinical palliative care service. So I spent a lot of time getting up to speed with how things worked in oncology and how OT fit in. And I was surrounded by nurses and physicians and psychologists. And frankly, I was dazzled by their specialized knowledge about symptom management and distress management and shared decision making. But I distinctly remember the moment it clicked for me about the contribution that OT can make in oncology. So as the project manager, I attended supervision sessions for the nurses delivering the palliative care intervention. And they talked about the issues that commonly come up in palliative care, symptom management and treatment decisions and communicating with your medical team. And I remember one meeting where we discussed a participant who wasn't experiencing many symptoms at the moment and he was coping well, and the nurses weren't sure what else they could or should do for him. And they had reviewed the education about fatigue management because that was the one symptom he had that bothered him. And when the nurse asked you how he was doing that week, uh, he said he was fighting with his wife about painting the kitchen cabinets. It was something that he had been planning to do before he was diagnosed, and he still wanted to do it, but he wasn't sure if he could because of his fatigue. And everyone around the table said like, ooh, yeah, that, that's hard, it's a big job. And they talked about how the nurse could work on communication skills and managing expectations and getting the patient and the wife on the same page because she was worried about him and telling him not to paint the cabinets because it would be too much for him. But he wanted to do it. It was a continuation of the home improvement he's always done. It was part of his identity and part of the legacy he wanted to lead. And as the conversation ended there and it moved on to the next participant, I distinctly remember sitting up and looking around thinking, no one here actually wants to talk about painting the cabinets. That's something I know something about. How to adapt activities to make things easier, how to modify the environment and the tools and prime the body so it has the best chance of doing the activity. That's my lane. So that moment was the start of my very strong opinion about OT's role in oncology. There are many people in disciplines doing great work about managing symptoms and reducing distress. And even in rehabilitation, the prevailing paradigm is referred to as impairment-driven cancer rehabilitation. And that is important and necessary and should absolutely be part of our practice. But far fewer people are focusing on what the symptoms and the impairments are keeping people away from. And I think that's our contribution. 
focusing on the activities. And I know that it's happening in OT practice, but we aren't showcasing this in the literature. The oncology world doesn't really know that we do this, and we don't have many evidence-based practices to guide how we do this. And so that's what I set out to do, along with a dear friend and colleague, Dr. Mark Hagel. And this was our goal. We were working with breast cancer survivors, and we wanted to help women find ways to fulfill their roles and engage in activities that are important to them, despite the many challenges that come with cancer treatment. So for the pilot study grants, it was a pretty easy argument to write because it was 2006, and the Lost in Transition report had just come out the year before. And that report identified a gap in cancer survivorship care, saying that we needed to help people resume work and school and life activities after treatment. But I'll be honest, when writing the R01 application in 2017, it was still a pretty solid argument because I could quote articles like this one from 2017 that said over a decade after the Lost in Transition report, Leaders are still calling for research and practice that helps survivors resume work and school and life activities. And as I said, I was working with a clinical psychologist and there's a large overlap in our interests and our tools. We both have the overarching focus on making sure that people can function in the real world and in their daily lives. And up to this point, I had been used to thinking of OT as a hands-on modality. They come to us, we do activities with people and they get better because a lot of the magic is in the actual doing together. But here's our first problem. In oncology, and particularly in my cancer center, they don't always come to us for rehabilitation. This map shows the towns where the participants in one of my home-based studies lived. And the H in the middle of the map uh, is, shows where our cancer center sits on the border of New Hampshire and Vermont. And many people drive more than an hour to come for their cancer treatment. And I did a debriefing interview after this particular study when I had gone to their homes. And I asked if they would come to the cancer center for the program if we offered it there. And one woman told me, you know, if I had known how helpful it was going to be, I definitely would have. But I had no idea this would be very helpful. So I probably wouldn't have enrolled if you weren't coming to my house. And this woman lived one mile from the hospital. I could have walked to her house from the hospital. Um, so that's what we were working with in our catchment area. And that's a somewhat common problem in cancer rehabilitation. But here's our second problem. Even if they did come to us, the functioning that we care about happens in the home and the community and the workplace. And we want a way to promote functioning in the real world. So we tried to figure out how we could blend what we knew to help women. And we turned to what Mark knew, cognitive behavioral therapies for depression, because a talking therapy that we could deliver by telephone would allow us to meet women where they were, um, in the middle of their busy lives, in their own communities. And CBTs have a built-in way to take the talk that happens in a psychologist's office and help people apply it in their daily lives. So we thought that we could use the structure of CBT to frame our rehabilitation. And what we did was use the structure of one particular cognitive behavioral therapy called problem-solving treatment, which is what Mark had extensive expertise in. And we infused it with some of what we do in occupational therapy. So each week we asked women to identify a meaningful activity that they were having trouble doing, either a healthy behavior like exercise or meditation, or an activity they need to do for work, like or parenting or leisure. And we had them flesh out these six steps so that each week they would be working on a behavioral goal related to their valued activities. And it was in the brainstorming step that we infused some of the OT mindset. We taught the participants to think like a therapist when they were having trouble doing an activity. We taught them to think flexibly about how to manipulate the environment or the way in which they do the activity or to use a symptom management technique to change something about their body or mindset to make it easier to do the activity. And when we did this in the first pilot study, we found that women use the problem solving and goal setting structure to address a wide variety of activities. So we were able to offer a participant directed intervention. 
where instead of saying, we have an intervention to help you with your fatigue or to help you exercise more, we had a recovery oriented intervention that one woman could use to work on leisure and exercise and stress management, and another woman could use to address work and home management and parenting. And we did a post-talk analysis to see if this approach actually did help them brainstorm diverse solutions to their activity challenges. And we found that it did. We developed a coding scheme for the solutions they generated, and they were generating the solutions. It was non-prescriptive. We never told them what to do. We just helped them think flexibly for brainstorming. And our coding system characterized the, the, the solution in terms of whether it changed who was involved, where the activity was done, when the activity was done, how it was done, or what they were actually doing. And we found that the women weren't just sticking with one option. It wasn't just, well, I'll ask for help from someone else. We would have coded that as a who strategy. But instead, their solutions really did show diversity across the five categories. And so in that study, we showed that activity adaptation skills could be caught, taught within this framework. But we also learned in the first pilot study that the full-blown problem-solving structure probably wasn't always needed. In another postdoc analysis, we analyzed what the women were trying to accomplish with their weekly goals, and we found that most of the time, they were using the intervention in the way we expected. They were trying to adapt an activity to make it easier or more enjoyable. But that only happened in 40% of the sessions. Sometimes they were trying to add a new activity to their routine. That was about 31% of the sessions. Or sometimes they knew exactly what they wanted to do, they just had to plan out the steps and how they were gonna do it. That was 19% of the sessions. And sometimes they were just trying to gather information to help them figure out what to do next. So we felt that the problem solving intervention worked well, but we thought we could probably streamline it. So for the second pilot study, we turned to another behavioral therapy called behavioral activation. And we developed an algorithm that could give the interventionist and the participant a cue for when they needed to incorporate the brainstorming steps. So the first two steps were the same as before in the upper left. We asked the women to identify an activity they wanted to do in the coming week and describe what was making it challenging. And then we taught them to set a goal that was behavioral, observable, and achievable. And then there was that diamond choice point. If they knew exactly what they wanted to do to meet the goal, for example, they knew they wanted to go to a particular gym class to get exercise. Then we dropped straight to the bottom and we created a detailed action plan. They'd go off and do it, and then next week we'd debrief and see how it went. But if they didn't know what to do, if they said, well, I want to get some form of exercise, but I can't imagine what I could possibly do comfortably, um, then we would take a detour. We'd do some brainstorming. We'd weigh the pros and the cons, we decide what to do and then end up in the same place with the action planning. And so in that second pilot study, we found the same thing in that they used the structure to address a wide variety of different activities. Um, so using the women as the unit of analysis, on average, they used our intervention to target four different types of activities. And they set an average of eight goals over the six week intervention. And they met 71% of the weekly goals that they set. And then we did another postdoc analysis where we looked at goals as the unit of analysis. And so we looked at the 141 weekly goals that they set during the second pilot study. We found out half the time they were targeting an activity that they are already doing, but they wanted to make it easier or more enjoyable. And then 47% of the time, they were targeting an activity that they hadn't been doing regularly, but wanted to add to their weekly routine, like resuming a leisure activity or starting to exercise. And we looked and we found that most of the time we were able to use straight behavioral activation, that left-hand column. And it was only about 13% of the time we needed to augment with problem solving when we were setting the goals. And so we used all of this information to help us try to refine the treatment manual. And we looked at the outcome measures. We combined two different pilot studies uh, where one of them had a no treatment run-in phrase. So week negative six to zero. 
And when we ran linear mixed models, we found no change in the run-in phase, and then a clinically and statistically significant improvement in the intervention, both in terms of overall quality of life that I'm showing here, and then also in functional well-being, one component of quality of life. And we argued that this was provisional evidence that the intervention could potentially accelerate the pace of recovery after cancer treatment, and that it warranted full-scale efficacy testing, uh, which is what we're doing now in the RCT we're currently running. Uh, so we've trained seven OTs to deliver the intervention. We're running the trial out of Dartmouth and with colleagues down at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And we just started the third year of the study. And so that's an overview of what we're doing. These are the great people I've had the privilege to work with in this research. Um, on the right column are the seven occupational therapists working on the current RCT. I feel very lucky to have them all on our research team. They are all practicing OTs who have one foot in the clinic and one foot in our research. And so I, I appreciate the chance to share this with you. Um, of all the studies I've worked on, this line of research is my favorite thing to talk about. And I loved both delivering the intervention in the pilot studies and mining the session data to understand how the women were using it and how we can make it better. And what I'm most proud of is that it's really true to the spirit of OT practice. As a profession, we don't just specialize in one activity or one modality. Our superpower is our ability to help participants and patients engage in whatever activities are important to them. So thank you, MJ. Thank you, AOTF, for organizing this event and allowing us to share our ideas and be inspired by each other's work. Dr. Sean C. Roll is an associate professor at the University of Southern California's Chan Division of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy, where he also directs the PhD in Occupational Science program. Dr. Roll is a licensed occupational therapist, registered sonographer, and an occupational scientist who studies the relationship between musculoskeletal conditions of the arms and hands, people's ability to perform activities, and their health outcomes within the workplace. His specialties include using ultrasound to study carpal tunnel syndrome, which affects an estimated 10 million Americans with an annual healthcare cost of $2 billion, funded by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. He also studies holistic approaches for improving and the experience and results of hand therapy. His largest current project funded by the National Science Foundation, is designing the next generation of intelligent smart desks that can automatically learn from, adapt to, and respond to users' habits and preferences to improve worker health and well-being. Dr. Roll's title of his talk is Enhancing Worker Health Through Multi-Level Transdisciplinary Research. Welcome, Dr. Roll, and thanks for being with us tonight. Great, thank you. I'm going to uh, share a little bit today here um, about my research and uh, when I was asked to give this talk, kind of what I went through in my process was really kind of uh, the question that I get a lot is how do all the different components and things that I do uh, fit together uh, into one cohesive uh, research approach. So um, in giving this talk for a Research Excellence Symposium, I, I really hope to kind of share uh, the uh, multi-level approach that I take and how I use an occupational therapy and occupational science lens uh, through transdisciplinary research to uh, really advance our understanding and support uh, worker health and well-being. So in uh, doing my research, uh, what kind of connects all these things together then is this understanding of occupational performance and how it contributes to health and well-being uh, within this work context. Um, particularly as an occupational therapist and uh, knowing the use of occupation and how it can support uh, health and well-being, improving connectedness, those sorts of things, as well as using occupations as a means for um, advancing recovery from injury or illness. 
Um, in fact, in my clinical uh, kind of work uh, in work rehabilitation with work conditioning, work hardening programs, I've uh, been able to demonstrate that using occupational tasks within that rehabilitation can increase the odds of successfully returning to work by six and a half times. So there is something to this, but in my research, I'm just as interested in uh, the components of how occupation and occupational performance contributes in a more negative way or the contributions towards stress, injury, um, declining mental well-being and those sorts of things, particularly with workers in the workplace. So this is what I kind of pulled together from my research and kind of thinking about um, the individual worker, how they behave, what they do in their workplace, what their workplace environment looks like, how those things contribute to disorders, injuries, uh, stress, and, and our general well-being. And not only that, but then how those things actually can contribute to or deter us from successfully preventing those injuries or rehabilitating individuals um, so that they can have uh, more productive, uh, successful, independent lives. So uh, my work uh, in my lab, the musculoskeletal sonography and occupational performance lab, really employs a holistic approach to examine these interrelationships across occupational performance, individual health, and overall well-being. Uh, there's two kind of primary areas of, of interest and, and targets here, uh, that being worker well-being uh, within these built or physical environments, the organizational and social context within which we work, as well as understanding how we evaluate, prevent, and rehabilitate individuals with musculoskeletal disorders uh, in, in to total. Um, so I take this approach of looking at occupational performance, understanding activities, um, occupations, participation, whatever the things are that we're doing in our work lives, um, and understanding then from an individual perspective, what is the structure and function of the tissues and the, the uh, different muscles and nerves and things within our body. Uh, using sonographic imaging is my primary tool and mechanism for doing so. And on the other side, then understanding health and health outcomes, uh, patient reported types of things uh, that we have. And so looking at these interconnections, how do we understand these things uh, in order to actually advance our prevention and treatment of work-related injuries, illnesses, uh, well-being, those sorts of things. For my students and those that know me well, I like to talk in metaphors all the time and use metaphors to explain my work and, and different uh, things. So the metaphor here today and what I use often to describe my work is thinking about pots on the stove. Um, I, my career started and, and uh, I always think about, you know, the one pot on the stove, working with that pot on the stove to, you know, get it to boil, uh, maintaining that pot at boiling and monitoring it to make sure that it doesn't overflow, that we don't have any problems using different tools and techniques to keep it from doing so. And thankfully to this point, I haven't had any problems where those pots have actually caught on fire or there's been any issues. Um, at this point in my career now, I talk about the fact that it's not just that one pot, but it's multiple pots. I'm really working toward, you know, a more complex meal and, and lots of different things kind of stewing and boiling and simmering all at the same time and trying to manage all those different things towards one goal. So today I want to share just a little bit about two of the pots uh, that you heard uh, in the introduction as well um, that are kind of the, the core areas of, of my current research. Um, first being uh, carpal tunnel syndrome and understanding kind of this relationship of occupational performance to uh, carpal tunnel syndrome and how it relates uh, to these other components of structure, function, and health. So as I mentioned, uh, I use sonographic imaging uh, to look at structure and function. Uh, here is just a demonstration of some of the things that we look at, um, and hopefully you'll be able to see my cursor on the screen. Um, in the top row of images here, um, uh, what you're seeing is we can place a sonographic uh, imaging transducer in a cross-sectional plane across the wrist, and we get this cross-sectional image. Um, we can then, in this image, identify the median nerve. The median nerve is what is impacted when we have carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, numbness, tingling, things in the hand. Um, so we can take this image of the median nerve, uh, trace around it, and measure essentially the area, the cross-sectional area of that nerve. You can see this is a healthy nerve. Anywhere between 6 and 10 millimeters squared in its cross-sectional area tends to be typical. When we turn the transducer in the long plane or look longitudinally at the same structure, you can actually see this dark kind of band uh, in the image here uh, by these arrows, which is the median nerve itself now in its length. And you can see again, it's nice and uniform in its, its shape across. 
in individuals who have uh, some symptoms, some problems, uh, maybe diagnostic with carpal tunnel, we actually see the size of this nerve enlarged. Uh, in this example, you can see a very severe case where we're almost three times uh, the size of, of the normal case. And when we look at the longitudinal plane, you actually can see the, the, the small size of the nerve on either end and this enlargement in the middle through where the carpal tunnel would be. In fact, when we looked uh, in the study of individuals with different levels of symptoms and severities of carpal tunnel and measured that cross-sectional area, you can see compared to our control group that didn't have any symptoms, uh, the individuals that were considered normal with the nerve conduction all the way out to physiologically having some very severe cases or problems, the size and shape of that nerve dramatically increasing. The question that we have then is, how do we get from this small to large nerve, and maybe what does the contribution of occupational performance have to this? Uh, at the outset of my career, I was lucky enough to be involved um, in, in a project that was looking at this exact uh, thing, where uh, we had a group of subjects, uh, monkeys that were trained to reach through a cage, bend their wrist, and squeeze a device to receive a treat. They were then set to work five, hours, uh, five days a week, eight hours a day. And over time, they developed signs, symptoms, and diagnostic uh, principles of carpal tunnel syndrome based on nerve conduction. We added the imaging, uh, and you can see across a group of, of subjects that the dark blue line here does demonstrate that there was a, a beginning increase in size of that nerve across time. And that's compared to these other lines that represent the nerve as measured in the forearm and as measured on the hand or the arm that wasn't working at all. So we were able to demonstrate that there was this relationship in our animal model, which led to the question of, how might this actually develop in the human? Uh, and so is this a linear relationship across time? Is there a delayed kind of response or an early response? What does this relationship actually look like? And can we measure that and understand it so that then we may be able to better prevent uh, problems for individuals who are somewhere along this trajectory? So uh, this kind of, I was able to pull together what I consider to be a transdisciplinary team of lots of different experts and landed in the, the realm of dental hygiene um, uh, to look at this problem uh, and uh, to work on this. Together, uh, we've been looking at across the last five years, just finished a study with about 120 dental hygiene students and about 50 OT students that were used as control participants, where we've been looking at uh, the differences and the development of things across time. You can see here our dental hygiene students as an example of looking at how they're performing their tasks. Um, we recorded, uh, we have about 150 videos that are two to three hours in length. Um, all measured simultaneously from three different camera perspectives, where we're looking at not only how is the student using their dental scaling instruments, um, what is going on with the hand and differences across students, but then generally even more so, how are they actually engaging in their workspace? What's their posture, their performance, all of those things. So we can get a full picture of what's going on with these students. Um, you can see we're looking at this full posture. Here's some early data. We have about half of the videos completed. This is about 76 of the videos uh, from two different programs. For those that aren't familiar with the rapid upper limb assessment, uh, it's a quick screening tool that's used to identify potential risk based upon postures. The higher the score, particularly the five, the six, the seven range, indicates that you're working in a posture that may be putting you at significant risk for long-term injury uh, due to your posture. So you can see there's a little difference between the two programs. Um, we're starting to identify, you know, how do these things relate to reports of pain and symptoms across the two years that we've actually measured these uh, uh, participants. You can also see that we're looking at other things about how they're performing in, in their, their work. Um, this, uh, the images at the bottom show you what's called clock position, which represents where they're sitting uh, as they're completing the dental scaling relative to the patient's mouth, whether it's the eight, nine, 10 o'clock position, which tends to be the primary position uh, at, at this program, uh, and a little more into the 10, 11, 12 o'clock uh, position uh, in the other program. Simultaneously, again, we're looking at relative specifically to the hand and what's going on there. We've looked at our videos and we've been able to identify three types of scaling that actually is occurring uh, with the hand. For those that have been to the dentist, which I presume is most of us, um, if not all, uh, you know that as you're at the dentist or with the dental hygienist, 
Um, you may perceive different types of scaling where there's light kind of uh, quick even strokes, some more moderate, more intentioned strokes, and then heavy scaling where it's deep kind of strokes that require more force and pressure. Um, also now uh, there's a lot of practices that are using ultrasonic scaling that now avoids that actual pressure with the hand itself. So this represents just one participant, uh, just to give you a demonstration of what we're looking at and being able to see how long they're doing each type of scaling, um, what uh, wrist posture or position is most prevalent or common during the scaling, whether they're flexed or extended. And we're putting that into the revised strain index then to look at um, over time across different visits, uh, within and across visits, what the actual exposure may be for the different students. Our goal then is to take this information and, and look at how it relates backward to the structure and function, forward and those sorts of things. Um, things that we're considering and looking at as an example here, this is my hand. Um, I've circled the carpal tunnel as well as the median nerve when my hand's at rest and merely holding a scaling instrument. And for those that may know dentistry, this isn't the appropriate way to hold the instrument. Um, I'm not doing a good modeling here, but in any case, just with that pinching, you can see how my nerve is being kind of compressed and, and entrapped. And so the question is individuals who exhibit this sort of, uh, of thing, are they at higher risk given the performance, particularly if they're doing heavier scaling activities? Um, we have seen in some early investigation of comparing our dental hygiene students to occupational therapy students, just mere reports of outcomes of incidents of hand pain fairly significantly in those dental hygiene students as compared to our control group of OT students. So we're trying to take this information now and go all the way across. Is there a way that we can understand and identify people potentially who have some sort of structure function that may predispose them to more injuries or illnesses based upon the performance that could help us explain why some people develop carpal tunnel and others don't? Um, some of the things we're using that are, are a little unique are some dynamic imaging techniques. In the video here on the left, you can actually see a video of somebody as they're opening and closing their hand, the median nerve here in the carpal tunnel, um, kind of hanging out, not really being uh, impacted too broadly by the uh, structures in the carpal tunnel versus the person on the right that as they open and close their hand, we have tendons and other muscles that sit in the carpal tunnel that you can see are contributing to compression and movement and all kinds of things with that nerve. And is there a difference then in how these people are experiencing symptoms across time? And this has implications not only for prevention of these individuals, um, can we then alter their performance, minimize gripping, um, but also into the clinical, into clinical practice for individuals who may have carpal tunnel syndrome, is there a way we can create a particular type of orthosis or supportive device um, independent to the individual that would reduce the compression in them that would look different than someone else. We're also using this technique in exploring dynamic imaging as a biofeedback mechanism um, for other types of conditions uh, as a way to improve uh, individual engagement in the hand therapy process and encourage movement and, and motion. So we're using this in a lot of different ways uh, as we move forward. And really our goal then with all of this data and hopefully in the next year or two, we'll have finalized all of our analysis from this longitudinal study across our 180 participants and really have some robust information. Um, other things then that I'm considering and looking at across my research are overlaying then the environment, uh, the physical environment, the social environment and organizational environment, which leads me into the other work uh, that's active going on uh, right now in the transdisciplinary team in this work uh, of engineering, psychology, computer science, um, architecture, where we're really looking at an office workspace and how we can use technology, particularly artificial intelligence, um, to address various uh, perspectives of uh, worker health, uh, energy, conservation in the workplace, uh, from a psychology perspective, understanding human technology interactions, um, and really moving forward to uh, kind of develop something brand new. So this really I see as more than just interdisciplinary, but true transdisciplinary work, where we're developing something completely new uh, based upon all of our expertise. Just a, a little bit about kind of my expertise and my interests, of course, in kind of how we're engaging in the workspace, our posture, um, what are indicators of stress, and how can we actually help to support worker behavior. Um, we've done a, a preliminary kind of steps of this with 20 uh, individuals uh, recording them for an hour at a workspace space 
um, we're working with the computer science uh, perspective to then develop algorithms that can identify where the joints are. Uh, from there, we can overlay uh, uh, the segments of the body and use some segmenting to identify the segments and blend those two things then together to actually identify specifically where the joint is, where the planes of the body are, and estimate angles. Um, this may look somewhat uh, familiar. Uh, the Connect camera can do some of this, but our algorithms are actually combining this a little more robustly than just looking at planes of the body. Um, and we begin looking, we had, uh, we've tested 1,600 uh, different uh, image captures across this, and we've run RULA scores on these, um, as well as then um, automated our, our algorithms. And you can see that we're doing fairly well with our algorithms at you know, being greater than 75% of the time, being able to accurately identify shoulder and elbow positioning uh, that may be at risk much better than just using general uh, kind of joint capture techniques in itself. Um, we're moving forward next and looking at the more complex joints of the neck and the trunk. Uh, these involve, of course, you know, three uh, planes of, of motion and movement that are simultaneously happening. So it's a little more complex that we're now working on algorithms to look at that. Simultaneously, I mentioned that we're also interested in the environment, so we're measuring things like lighting, temperature, sound, uh, humidity, other things in the environment. Uh, we've developed a user interface that the user at, at the workplace can then provide feedback to the system as to how comfortable they are, whether they want a device on or off, those sorts of things. And we're using that information all to train algorithms and test algorithms that can try to automatically adjust the environment so that it's more comfortable, more supportive for the work, whatever may be going on. In some focus groups that we've run, office workers uh, are excited about this in general, um, seem to be you know, thinking that this would be something that would be really useful, but there are considerations and concerns that have uh, arisen, particularly related to uh, this device not changing things or communicating in a way that would be interruptive. Um, and so really we've come down to having to understand and teach a computer how to know when somebody is really deeply engaged in their activities. Uh, when should I not uh, interrupt somebody? When are they doing something that is, uh, shouldn't be kind of uh, 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 interrupted so that they can continue their workflow? So we've taken our videos now and we're all also looking observationally at the behaviors, what people are doing. We've been able to identify some patterns across different participants in they're relatively sedentary, they're moving a little bit, engaging in and out, or they're kind of engaging in various things and moving about. We're now coding the activities that they're actually doing to see if we can come up with some inputs into our AI system that would tell the computer, hey, this person may be in deep state of flow or they're really engaged in their work. Probably not a good time to you know, really interrupt them or maybe a good time to provide them with some additional supports in the environment to help make sure they're working well. We're looking hopefully in the future at other behavioral things uh, that would indicate stress and those sorts of things that we can continue to move this into the workplace. So we're very excited about that work. Um, I have lots of other things, lots of other pots uh, going on also. Um, you know, my interest in worker health, uh, working collaboratively with a lot of my, my colleagues um, and exploring ways that we can come together to really build a collaborative or a center for worker health that embeds some of these future uh, ideas, technologies, and things to support work. Uh, so we're working on some of those things more broadly. I'm engaged directly in the sonography community um, and looking at this as well and developing a registry where we can actually monitor and understand different components that go all the way from the individual worker through the organizational environment and policies that are impacting uh, work injuries and how we might be able to support the profession. Um, using the imaging and clinical practice, I mentioned the biofeedback work, but we're also looking from a musculoskeletal perspective at other things like flexor tendon repair um, and looking at the sutures and looking to see when is somebody healed well enough that we can actually begin active therapies and be productive. Uh, some other work I, I've been contributing to looking in scleroderma and measuring dermal thickness more as an outcome measure uh, with the imaging. So different ways of using the imaging to help us advance the rehab. And finally, uh, the use of mind-body techniques, not only the biofeedback with imaging, but also mindfulness 
as an adjunct to therapy to help with engagement and adherence, and in other uh, aspects with work. I'm very interested in how mindfulness or mind, mindful kind of programming can help us moderate our behaviors in the workplace and kind of support uh, improved wellness and reduction of injuries. Um, so I, I, I'm very grateful um, to uh, be giving this presentation um, and to be joining the uh, uh, Academy of Research. Um, and I wouldn't be where I am today, of course, without you know the folks that have trained me in the past and what I now consider as all my sous chefs and everything that's going on in my lab uh, to really create some exciting things. Um, so I'm, I'm forever grateful to the mentors and those that have given me support along the way, particularly Dr. Case Smith, uh, Dr. Evans, and Dr. Baker um, for their direct mentoring and support, and others who have provided uh, you know, the, the encouragement and supports uh, to be successful. And of course, the robust uh, amount of students and other folks that have helped to support the work directly in my lab. Uh, again, grateful to all of them and grateful to uh, the Academy of Research and AOTF uh, for this, this honor. Um, here's my contact information, uh, information for my lab, where you can find us. Uh, then I would welcome uh, any further contact or questions that anybody might have uh, regarding my work. Thank you very much. talks, everyone. Thank you so much. The talks were just fantastic. And what really struck me was the breadth of research in occupational therapy across the career trajectory, which was, was great. I'm going to invite uh, the attendees to please uh, ask questions by putting them in the Q&A area. And we'll, while we wait for some questions, um, I was also struck um, by, by a common theme across all your presentations, which relate to team science um, and transdisciplinary and multidisciplinary colleagues, networks, uh, and collaborators. Um, and Shauna, you actually, and Jessica, I, well, all of you, I think also talked, or at least recognized in the last slide, mentors who were OTs and non-OTs. And I was wondering, um, if anyone wanted to comment on the importance of team science collaboration and networking as, as a successful strategy for a research career. And any one of you, um, please, or mo more than one of you. I, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in first. I think uh, knowing that this was kind of the foundation of, of what I saw as my talk, um, and I really uh, uh, think that it's quite important for anybody who's doing research to uh, be engaged and be involved in, in transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, all these different uh, uh, things. My uh, work sits, I think, across, and, and I always say that occupational therapy, occupational science, that we sit on the line. Um, I really believe that, that our skills and our knowledge um, helps to connect the dots between lots of other disciplines and lots of under, other understandings. So I think that it's a natural thing for us to have these interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary relationships. Um, and so, uh, you know, I encourage people to think about that. What sits just outside your bubble? How are you connected to other professions, other ways of thinking and knowing? And then look to those professions and look to those folks to kind of help to move your career forward. Great, Sean, sure. thank you. Kathy, go ahead, please. Yeah, I definitely echo that. Um, speaking as someone who has been living on soft money alone for 18 years now, I could not do it without colleagues who, I, you know, some of them are, sometimes it's I'm the PI and I write them into my grant because I need their expertise to round out what I'm doing. And sometimes it's, um, they're the PI and they, I bring a method they need or I bring content expertise. And it's, it's actually, so it, it's selfishly so enjoyable and it's just helped me to grow because I would say my research sits 
in sort of the uh, intervention development space. But the work that I've been able to do with colleagues in palliative care, that's in the of where I want to get to with my own interventions and where I'm going. And so it's, it's very helpful and um, all boats rise. Thank you. Great. Um, there is there is a question um, from the audience. What advice, and I, I open it to um, each of you to think about and respond if, if you're willing, what advice would you give to early career researchers regarding balancing more optimistic research opportunities ver versus focusing very specifically on a specific uh, research career trajectory? Uh, I'm happy to try and give my own perspectives. So I was really struck by Dr. Lee's image of the straight line versus the curvy line. And I think my answer is potentially a little bit of both. And I'm interested to see what other people here think. Um, I think you have to start to very strategically, particularly if you are on a tenure track line and you are wanting to be funded for a certain expertise. I think it's important to think very systematically about how you document and build that expertise, whether that's in publications that are around similar topics or that use similar content methodology, or whether that's as Dr. Lyon shared, are you going in as a team member? Um, on other projects, but with a common expertise. But that said, I think it's also really important to identify new opportunities to grow and to share, because I think all of our research has, we have a core and it always takes uh, different directions based on the opportunities that, that come up. But I know, so that's kind of a non-answer. That was a good answer, Jessica. Yeah, I also actually... like to respond. Cynthia, please. Yeah, I agree with Jessica. I think you, you can have both, right? Because when you are trying to do your specific area, it's kind of you are developing your specific research skills. But when you are expanding your research uh, expertise, it's kind of like what we talk about co collaborations with others. So you can actually expanding uh, the impact of your research work. And you can also learn to um, I think the one of maybe the biggest advantage of co collaborating with others and expanding your research area is really you can have more efficient publications. And at the same time, you develop like communication, self-management because, or leadership skills. So, um, so I think it's really nothing wrong <laughs> either way. I think that that's both way you will learn a lot. Um, but I also want to, kind of like throw out the idea when you are collaborating with others, you need to find a balance, right? You don't want to totally expand into the way like never ending and you are just doing multiple things at the same time and there's no focus. So you would really want to focus the area, you really want to dig into and develop your skills in certain area, but you also really uh, want to expand in your research. And I hope this is a uh, kind of answer, maybe part of it. And, and I, I just want to add to this. Um, I think I agree with everything that's been said. But what I would want to add is don't forget to do what you love. Um, I think that I've been invited on or I've seen lots of opportunities that have come up. And it's like, oh, that's a really great opportunity. And I know that it will go somewhere. And it, it's a struggle. Because if you don't really enjoy it and it's not really something you're passionate about, it can really be one of those things, oh, I'll get to it later, or oh, I don't really want to go to that meeting, or oh, you know, those sorts of things. So I, I think that you have to really know what you love and what you are passionate about and make sure that, you know, thinking about a career trajectory, you know, what are those things? And then when there are opportunities that arise that may sit slightly off the side or that may, may be oh, that's an interesting way to think about it. I think that's what you have to go for. And I think in the world of funding, if you're looking for grant funding, you have to be able to do that. Um, you have to mold and shape and write and direct your aims and your research toward an agency or a funder that has a very specific goal in mind. And so you have to then morph your ideas into what they're looking to do. Once the money comes in, you can then 
add on to that and you can look at things simultaneously. You can do the project that's meeting their goals and also expand and explore the things that you want to do. So I think it's really important to make sure that you keep in mind what drives you and what you're passionate about or else it will become work rather than becoming so much fun to just do research. Great advice. Thank you, Sean. Um, an, another question, and again, I open it to each of you. Um, what advice do you have for identifying and building that network of collabor collaborators and mentors for team science? How, how do you do that? Be in the right place at the right time and know the right people. <laughs> um, unfortunately, that's a lot of it, I think. In my career, it's just, it's been generative. So I think from that perspective, it's putting yourself in the places that you will be able to build and develop and grow. So don't be afraid to go to conferences that are maybe not directly within your realm. Don't be afraid to speak up and talk to somebody, introduce yourself, put your name out there in different places, because that's when those relationships come to you. That's when those things happen and occur. So. I know that's not really great advice, but you know, it, it happens, but you know. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think a lot of it is networking, getting it out there, getting, you know, finding out who's publishing in the area you're interested in, meeting them at different places. I don't know if this is advice for the younger person, but the advice for mentors is that's one of the best functions of a, a really good mentor is they are looking for those opportunities for you. And so I do know when I was a junior faculty um, with a new, you know, a PI who was doing a million things and too busy to do all of them, he was like, I'd like you to meet the newest, you know, the newest member of my team. She joined us. She's going to manage this project, but she's looking for, you know, she's building her own line of research. Um, and so that, sorry, that's what a good mentor really does. Um, so it's hard to find the good mentor when you're a junior faculty, but that's another one of the magic formulas. It's just someone who opens the first door so that people start to know you and what you do and what you bring to a team and, and then showing up and doing the work. Great, great. Um, here's another, uh, question. In Susan Garber's 2016 Slagle lecture, she discussed the prepared mind. How do you think having a prepared mind has helped you in your work? And again, I'd, I'd open it to um, each of you or any of you who would like to respond. Jessica, do you want to respond? Oh. Sorry, my computer mouse froze. I couldn't unmute. I apologize. No worries. One of the things that I have always found is that working on one project, potentially with one mindset, I will find something new that I hadn't discovered sort of um, leading into something else in unexpected ways. So maybe I'm working on one project and I'm really thinking about um, the construct of function, or I'm really thinking about the idea of what it means, uh, what intersectionality means. And I'll go to a meeting, an event, a talk with the same people that I've always talked to. And suddenly I see sort of a new opportunity or a new way to approach that group or contribute to that group based on this other idea that maybe I'm working on in another project. So I like working on multiple projects at the same time and that's one of the reasons I feel like it primes my mind to notice new opportunities that might come up um, in other existing projects or in potential new projects. I, I don't know if it's the prepared mind, but I bet I'm not alone in this phenomena in phenomenon. In terms of sometimes you're doing your work and you've, you're, you've taken all your notes and you're saying, and then it's on the commute home or on the commute in or on the treadmill. I've often had to pull over or get off the treadmill to jot something down because I find like that's when it starts being like the puzzle pieces. I'm like, that's the argument. That's how to do the outline. 
those are how the things go together. And so sometimes it's that it's, you know, some part of it is when you're actively working and then part of it is when your mind is slowly doing something else habitual that um, it's nice to have paper and pencil handy in the car or in the <laughs> down in your workout room for those moments. Cause that, that's sometimes when I feel like it comes together in a way. Excellent, thank you. Um, Jessica, I'll direct this question to you. Although if anyone else would like to respond, um, please do. There is a question about the importance of working with children and families uh, children with epilepsy, epilepsy in their families, and there is a considerable gap in knowledge um, in that practice area. Um, can you collect data um, with children with epilepsy in their families, and, and uh, what would you recommend? Yeah, I was. Uh, what a great question. Um, thank you so much, Dan. I, I was. I whenever I hear someone, I always think, okay, well, where's the gap? And um, what's the gap that OT can address? And it reminds me of Dr. Lyons painting the cabinets. You know, so what, what is everyone else talking about? And what are the things that um, you think are important? Um, and sometimes it could be, um, as you're, uh, I think, pointed out, is that there might be a measurement gap, right? So people have, may not have even thought about um, uh, collecting that information. And there may or may not be an appropriate measure uh, to examine the things that you're looking at with that population. And another great first step is maybe there is, a, I'm going to say an occupation, a participation, a function focused measure that's been used in OT and other groups. And maybe one of the first steps is to demonstrate that it can be used and it's appropriate for um, that uh, group of families and, and children. So that's one of the first things that I, I think of. And, and it's not just about epilepsy and children and their families, that could be any population. Great, thank you. Um, given the lack of diversity in our profession, um, you, you all have all given some advice to all of us as researchers, early career, mid-career, how to build team science, but given the lack of diversity in our field, would the advice you have provided tonight be different for individuals who are black or brown or Latino? Well, in full disclosure, I don't know that I can speak to that because I don't share that experience. Um, I think that the importance of mentors um, from my understanding is, is really crucial, but I also think that might be mentors who have some of those same shared experiences. But I also think that looking for mentors who are allies, um, who are willing to acknowledge and talk about um, lack of representation um, across uh, race, language, ethnicity, uh, sexual uh, identity, um, uh, disability, uh, in our profession in the sciences. Um, and so identifying maybe, uh, and really approaching it upfront with people to see how uh, people um, take that on and are willing to be a champion, right? So one of the benefits um, that I have been trying to do is as a person who, for example, is white, identifies as white and other people identify as white, how can I leverage uh, that identity to support other people who may not be able to leverage that? And I guess, again, I, I'm not sure that, you know, from the vantage point, who knows, but I, I would say the thing that's encouraging is I do think, um, you know, when I did my undergrad, uh, my master's degree, I started in qualitative research, where we start about, you know, you have a whole chapter about your social autobiography, and how you're positioned, and what things you notice, and what things catch your attention, and how we work in science to hone that view and expand that view. And I feel like that's coming back in fashion that um, at least now we are embracing multiple perspectives. I find job candidates are far more likely to, to position themselves in terms of their identity, their gender, their background, their 
um, all sorts of things. And so I don't know that I have advice. I only have hope in the sense of, I think there's finally an acknowledgement that it's not necessarily this, oh, pure scientific lens that we can all be objective. I think now there is an acknowledgement that um, science helps us be objective and be systematic, but we all start from a position and have different um, experiences that we hone. So I, I don't have advice, but I have uh, mild optimism for all of us. Great, Kathy, thank you. Um, Sean, I'll, I'll direct this question to you and again, you are all invited to respond. NIH centers have been supporting bench research for decades. Is there a movement by them to support team science moving to the community? With the limited amount of money for research as a nation, we need to be funding studies that examine people with conditions and their need after diagnosis or hospitalizations to return to the community park bench, church bench, or bench at the mall to use the bench nomenclature. Uh, yeah, I, I wish, right? Um, I think uh, there has been, you know, there, there's been a tug and pull from what I've seen at NIH over the last 10 years to try to move in this direction. But I do think that NIH as a whole still has this very core mission of mechanism and understanding. Um, there are initiatives and there are lots of, you know, money that is now being put into smaller pockets for very intentional approaches to try to encourage some of this. Um, I think that uh, one of the great things that's uh, come out, I guess it's been about 10 years now, um, uh, with the launch of the Affordable Care Act is uh, PCORI um, and the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Initiative, which is really filling that gap a lot, I believe, and providing opportunities for there to be more of this direct kind of engagement type research um, and involving patients, involving stakeholders in the review process and in a very intentioned, meaningful way um, in the research. So there are new things that are emerging. And I think there's uh, you know, a lot of foundations now that are giving bigger and bigger money um, when you look at the Gates Foundation and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And so all of these kind of foundations are really moving and filling that gap, I think, in a, in a nice, meaningful way. NIH has tried, um, but I think that it's a huge uh, ship, and we all know how hard it is to turn and steer a ship. Um, and again, there are little pockets that I do see um, in different institutes that are, are trying to move this direction. Um, but it is challenging. Um, it is challenging as you know, being in this realm of trying to study engagement and understand how to do this to find those funding agencies that really want to move that forward. Great, thank you. And AOTF is sponsoring a webinar on authentic uh, engagement um, of stakeholders in research May 27th. So just so people know, we have about two minutes and I have one question left. Um, and I'd like you just in one or two sentences so that we leave on time to respond and we'll just go around. We'll start with um, Cynthia. Um, any suggestions to share the value of what an occupational therapist's lens can bring when, when proposing research ideas with collaborators outside of our profession? So in one or two sentences. That's a very big question. <laughs> yeah. I would say, um, I would say you, you need to have a mindset. Um, so if we are talking about OT research, one or two sentences, you need to know what you are looking for. And you have very clear in mind, you want to look at what outcomes that OT can be part of. So I think that will be my approach. Excellent, thank you. Kathy, how about you? Um, I, I generally, I'll go back to the, the thing I always go to, I'm generally characterized as I'm really interested in making sure people can, and I focus on the activities, not the symptoms, not the impairments. I care about symptoms and impairments, but I always start with the activity and drill down. And I think the beauty is we, we care about things that are accessible, so people kind of get it. They don't know how we're gonna do it, and they don't know how we're gonna measure it, but they, they get that it's important, I guess. Great, thank you. Jessica. I was gonna say, I like 
thinking about our approach to thinking of the environment, both systematically and dynamically, and how that impacts then uh, what we see for performance function or participation. Awesome. And Sean? Yeah, I think it's really the complex interplay across all of the systems that we understand and bring it from more of the human individual perspective. And I think for anyone that's looking for it, I would just recommend, you know, looking into occupational science, all of the components of what, you know, we think about theory wise of how we engage in our environments and engage in activities that kind of is growing in the, the realm of occupational science literature is, is hugely important and, and easy for other people to really understand that, oh, this makes sense. It's how we actually engage as humans in what we're doing and that that's the important kind of component that OT brings. Excellent. Thank you so much. Well, it's eight o'clock. Um, this was a fantastic session and I want to congratulate all of you um, for your awards and I want to thank everyone who um, attended tonight and um, have a great night and I think we'll sign off right at eight o'clock p.m. Eastern time. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.